Should we care of our parents in any way, shape, or form? Uh, well, you know, uh, yeah, the question is again, should we try to be makar of our parents if our parents are not Shomer Shabbos or not religious? Uh, what role do we place? Uh, you got to proceed with extreme caution. My first instinct was to say no, but I, I want to qualify it a little bit. Uh, if you lecture your parents, if you criticize your parents, if you even suggest that your parents do this or that or that or that, that is a recipe for failure. Uh, they are the parents, you are the child. And uh, certainly from their perspective, it is not your role to tell them how to live their lives. And they also see that as a great, great insult. You know, I, in fact, by the way, it's not only a problem with non-religious parents. It's even an issue with parents who are religious, but they're a bit more modern than the fanatic kid that their yeshiva boy turned into, uh, in which the, the kid is essentially saying that, hey, you know, uh, all of your superficial Judaism didn't count. And by the way, rabbis go through that as well. Uh, a rabbi once told me, and, I, and I, I've even experienced this, that the proof of his success is when the people he sent to yeshiva don't talk to him anymore. Uh, then he knows he's done his job. He's saying it somewhat uh, sadly, that he's made them so religious that they look at him as an apikoris. You know, so he says, Baruch Hashem, <laughs> I've succeeded. And you know, and again, I've, I've, I've been at the, uh, the, t the tail end of that as well. And I have to admit, uh, in, a way, in a way, God is giving me back my medicine because I had certain behaviors myself as a yeshiva bacher vis-a-vis rabbis who were very, very influential on me. So, you know, the cycle <coughs> repeats itself in sometimes negative ways. So you've got to be very, 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 very careful. On the other hand, uh, there is a type of kirov that can be extraordinarily uh, effective, and that is indirect kirov through example. And uh, your parents see you as a respectful person, as a loving person, as a caring person. They see that the fact that you went to yeshiva not only didn't change the good behaviors that you had, but it even accentuated them and made them better. And then, you know, they're going to want to make you happy because they see this is important to you. And they'll try to accommodate because you never made a demand on them. And at some point, they'll also may come to the conclusion that, hey, if mitzvos make my son a better kid, then maybe it's something to look into. So in that sense, you can be very, very effective uh, indirectly influencing your parents. But by no way, no way do you ever do this in any type of direct, uh, direct way. Uh, and I say in Baruch Hashem, uh, there have been many, many cases where parents have become, you know, maybe not 100% from, but they've become you know, more, more observant because of this, uh, because they see that it's been good for their child. And if it's good for their child, it's something they're going to open themselves up to. Okay, so you got to be very careful. Yeah. Uh, I have three quick questions on Tehillim. The first is... Uh, I'm sorry, on what? On Tehillim. Yeah. The first is, which Tehillim do we absolutely must say every day right now? Um, the second question is, if I set aside two hours to learn, how much of that do I stop learning and just do Tehillim? The third is, if I'm in my mamad or safe area, I'm learning Mishnah or Shemit, and the sirens go off, do I drop my learning and go to Tehillim or just... Yeah, yeah. So these are three questions about Tehillim. Tehillim is obviously a very, very important Avaida right now. Uh, it opens up the gates of mercy. Uh, Tehillim, and we say Tehillim all the time, but Be'es Sara, certainly Tehillim is a very, very important issue. Uh, so the question was, uh, number one, three questions. Question number one is, uh, which Tehillim absolutely have to be said? The short answer is there's no, there's no such thing as which Tehillim have to absolutely be said. There are a number of recommendations. I'll mention a few recommendations. But by far, the more important thing is to say Tehillim with Kavana, and no matter what you say is going to be good. There is no magic, so to speak, in specific things that you say. However, nevertheless, um, obviously it makes the most sense to pick Tehillim that talk about adversity, that talk about struggle, that talk about enemies wanting to destroy us, so, you know, so as a result, you know, there are certain numbers that they're given uh, to Hillim number 20, which, by the way, is part of our davening uh, every day. Uh, God should answer you on a day of Tzara. Tehillim number 20 is obviously a very good candidate. Uh, to Hillim number 91, which is Yoshe B'Sei Sorelyan, which is called the Protect the Shir Shel Pegaim, the song that protects you from all bad things. 91 is a very important one. And then in the Shir Hamalos, later on, uh, you have 121, 
Esa Enai, I lift up my eyes to the mountains, and 130, Mima Makim, from the depths, I call out to you, God. And then in the Ayans, I don't remember the exact number, but in the 70s, you will see specific Tehillim about enemies that try to destroy us uh, and the like. So really, you know, um, obviously, if you're with a minion, say what the minion is saying, but if you're by yourself, uh, you know, you can leave through it, and you know, you can almost figure out yourself uh, what would be the most appropriate at the time. Now, that was the first issue about specific to Hillim. Uh, the second, uh, what was the second so question? My learning Seder, I'm not able to go to Yeshiva, I work, I have blood. Yeah. So, so I have two hours set aside yeah. for Mamish learning. Yeah. I was wondering if I need a, a portion of that for Hillim. So again, uh, you know, it's not like because it's to Hillim, so learning doesn't count. I mean, learning is still a tremendous, tremendous sechus. And in fact, it's interesting. Rav Chaim Volashner says in the Nefesh Chaim, a fascinating point. Uh, he says that David HaMelech, when he wrote to Hillim, he prayed to Hashem that may my words be as acceptable to you as the learning of Negayim and Oalos, which are some very hard Masechlis in Seder Tyrus. And Rav Chaim Belashner says, we don't have any evidence that Hashem answered his request. <laughs> so Rav Chaim Belashner actually said learning might be a higher Madrega. So I would recommend that if you only have two hours to learn, meaning if you're learning the whole day, so you, know, you can take out more time for Tehillim, if you only have two hours to learn, you should allocate 15 minutes to Tehillim. And I think an hour and 45 would still be an appropriate uh, learning if, if, if you're limited in time that way. Uh, the third question about running to a shelter? No, if I'm already in a Mamad or a oh, place oh, and yeah, I'm learning, yeah. and the siren goes off, uh, I was wondering if I stop the learning and go to Tehillim. Oh, you're already in a safe place. Um, yeah, I think, I think when, when there is mamish and imminent sakana, that is a time you know, take to Hillim. But in your normal schedule, as I say, I would make it a 15 minute, the beginning or the end, end of it. And finish yeah. the pasuk or just drop everything and go to the table? Well, fin finish, the, finish, the, you know, finish what you're doing and then, then move to Hillim. Yeah. What scenario in Israel would, would obligate us to leave the country? Uh, back from sakana or, or other things? Is there such a scenario that, that could exist that would, that would make it? Yeah, the question is, is there any point at which there might be an obligation to leave Israel because it's a dangerous place and therefore you're, uh, you're not allowed to deliberately put yourself in danger? You're supposed to, you're supposed to leave. Uh, you know, theoretically, uh, there may be such an idea. Uh, practically, I, I, I totally disagree with it. I, and as I don't think it should be implemented uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, the world as a whole is dangerous. And as strange as this may, say, may sound, you know, we're in the middle of a war now, and a very, very difficult war, and a war in which many, many people have died. Well, uh, Jerusalem is still safer than New York City and, and most American places, even in the middle of a war. Now, I would even say, okay, that's probably exaggeration, that maybe Stay Road is safer than New York City. You, you, you know, okay, okay, maybe that's a, a little bit of an extreme. Uh, but the point is, the notion that somehow I will escape danger by moving myself to the United States or to England or to France or, or South Africa is just a mistake. It is fallacious thinking. Hashem is basically telling you the world is dangerous. And here is the thing. If the world is dangerous and Islamic fundamentalism and violence will rear its ugly head anywhere you go, anywhere you go, then I would rather be in Israel. I would rather be in Hashem's country. I would rather be with my people as we go through a difficult struggle. So the notion that you know, Israel is so super dangerous that halakhically you're obligated to get out of here, uh, you know, that is not at all uh, the case. Now, theoretically, if one lived in dangerous combat areas, there may be an obligation to evacuate. And indeed, the Israeli army has evacuated. Uh, some of the towns uh, near the Gaza Strip. And you can even raise a question, this is already a very, very sensitive question, how logically are you allowed to live there? Right? there? There are those who take the position that we are obligated to settle every part of Eretz Israel. Others say, you know, you don't do that to put yourself and your family in direct danger. But those are marginal areas. I mean, for this part of the country, etc. cetera, uh, how logically I would absolutely not, not accept the argument of a makam sakana. Baruch Hashem, it's that way. Yeah. Um, so, when you have, like, say, Gishmak to Torah learning, in the middle of all this, like, you're happy, like, you're learning, you know, and then you feel, like, this great joy, and then you remember, oh, 
this is happening, how do we how do we respond to them knowing like this is kind of a bad time and it's like this? And then then pair that and make like some kind of conciliation between those two things. Yeah, you know, uh, the issue becomes that obviously uh, we should feel the suffering that so many Jewish people are going through during this particular time. It should be our suffering. It is our suffering. Um, the people that have died, the families that are grieving, uh, the hostages that have been taken, and how the families must be going insane, worrying about them, and the people themselves, what they're going through. And uh, as I mentioned again yesterday, if one does not feel the pain of other Jews, and one is indifferent to that suffering, that is what the Rambam calls poresh midarchi atzibor, you are separating yourself from the congregation of Israel. And the Rambam writes, even if you keep mitzvahs and learn Torah, you lose your share in olam haba, because you don't care. So to simply say, you know, it's, you know, it's not our problem, I hope it'll be okay, but I don't really get upset about it, is very, very wrong. On the other hand, there is also an imperative of serving Hashem b'simcha. I had mentioned, I think, on Simchas Torah, uh, uh, something from Rav Schiller, he should be well, uh, he pointed out that Navua prophecy, can only come to a prophet when he is joyous. Okay? Now, problem is, most of the prophecies, maybe not all, not all of them certainly, but many, many, many prophecies, are prophecies of gloom and doom and destruction and death. Yermio wrote the book of Echa, the book of Lamentations. Now, if these were prophetic revelations, they must have been received in a state of joy. So how do you understand that? How does that compute? How do you receive prophecies that there'll be death, destruction, devastation in a matzah of joy, which otherwise, without that joy, you wouldn't receive it, right? There seems to be a contradiction. And the answer is that there is a certain compartment compartmentalization that we are capable of, and that means I am joyous that I'm connected to God. I am joyous I have a Torah. I am joyous I have a destiny. I have a purpose. I have a function. And then I look at life and I see the difficulties. And I identify with suffering and, and I, I pray to Hashem for Rachamim. You got to have both. Now, to give you an example in a different area, it's from the Balatanya. And this is something that it always strikes me how he was able to kind of turn the emotions on and off because everything was controlled by the seicha. That's the whole sheet of the Balatanya, in which he says, a person should have a half an hour a day where they cry over their sins and they realize their utter worthlessness and they realize how unworthy they are to be before God and they're garbage and they're nothing, right? A half an hour a day, you should cultivate that feeling Look at the clock. When the half an hour is gone, you're joyous, happy, serving God b'simcha. Now, it's hard for us to understand what that even means. If a person gets himself into a matzav where I'm so depressed over what a failure I am in life. And then, okay, now be happy. But the truth is, on the deepest level, if your emotions flow from your ethical and moral and intellectual consciousness, things can be controlled that way. Just like they have these um, Buddhist guys, they can control their heart rate and their, uh, you know, all sorts of things that are normally autonomous, but they're able to control it, their pulse and, and the like. So too, a Ben Torah at a higher level can actually control the particular feelings that they're going to have. And it's, a, it's very much of a challenge. Part of it is, uh, one of the ideas of mindfulness is you're living in the moment. When I'm living in a particular moment, this is my moment. Right now I'm learning. Right now I'm besimcha. And I don't allow other things to interfere with that. And then I go on to the next thing. And then I focus on that. I'm not thinking about the next step when I'm involved in this, uh, this step. You know, they say, I'll tell you two stories. Uh, one with the Moshe Feinstein and one with um, a free addict of the Babacha Rebbe. So, uh, with the Moshe Feinstein, the Moshe Feinstein, if you ever see pictures of him, he spent whatever f time he had that he was not talking to people, which was not necessarily that much time, he was always writing chidushim. He was writing, you know, chidushay Torah, and chuvos and chidushay Torah. And if you learn Rav Moshe's chuvos, and particularly his chidushim on Gemara, 
They are so intricate, they are so complicated. Even in Igros Moshe, most people, they just want to know the Pesach. Rav Moshe has an interesting shaila. They look at the last paragraph or the last sentence, mutter or usher. To, go, to actually go through the reasoning, that, that's too hard already. Moshe's reasoning is so complicated. I want to know, did he moderate it, didn't he moderate it? You know, that people look at the bottom line. And his chidushim on Gemara are basically impossible. I mean, they are so, it'll take like one word of the Gemara and go through 50 pages explaining the significance of the word, and you just wonder. So obviously it takes a lot of concentration to go through that. And people point out that he was constantly interrupted with shyness and emergencies and personal issues. And he always stopped and he always listened. And people, and sometimes for hours. And they say that when you were talking to Rav Moshe, you never had a sense that you, know, you were being rushed or he had to do something else. He was with you. You were the only person in the world. There was nothing else. And so, as a result, people sometimes took advantage of him. They would just go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, but whatever. Uh, he took a position. If they needed that, then they needed that too. That was part of his class. He said, you know, even people were sometimes just telling stories or, 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 or whatever it is. Now, right after he finished those lengthy conversations, he resumed his writing sometimes in the middle of a sentence without having to like rethink or get in the mood or whatever it is. He just moved from this to that, to that, to that, to that. He didn't need to get in a mood, get out of a mood, because everything was avoda Hashem in that way, an amazing thing. Now, with the Lubavitcher story, or I tell this is a story about the Rebbe Rashab, Rav Shalom Bear. The Rebbe Rashab was two Rebbe's ago, right? The, Last Rebbe was Rabbi Nachem Mendel, and the one before was his father-in-law, the Riyats, Rav Yosef Yitzchak, and before Rav Yosef Yitzchak was the Rebbe Rav Shalom Ber or Rav Shalom Dov, Schneerson. He was actually one of the most philosophical Lubavitcher Rebbe's. They call him the Mori Nebuchim of Hasidus, like the, uh, because he had the greatest philosophical depth. Uh, so because he was a serious, introspective person, you know, sometimes Hasidim are boisterous, right? But uh, Rashab was like a thinker and uh, this and that. So, um, you know, the minig of Hasidim is they give out honey cake, Erevim Kippur. Uh, so the Rebbe Rashab was very deep in thought to Erevim Kippur. So this Hasid comes up and like bellows, Rebbe, lekach, where's the honey cake? So the Rebbe Rashab tells him, you know, it's Erevim Kippur, it's time to think, time to be serious, what do you, you know? So the Hasid told the Rebbe, it's an amazing thing, he says, you know, Rebbe, we are soldiers. The morning of Erev Yom Kippur, we're supposed to have honey cake and rejoice. Later in the afternoon, we cry and we do tshuva. He says, but now is the time for honey cake. And uh, the Rebbe said, the chassid was right. There's a time for simcha, a time for joy, and then you have a time of introspection and crying. You're soldiers in Hashem's army. You have different jobs, different times of the day, and you have to learn how to move between them. So I'm bringing all this in to kind of show the idea that you got to move with emotions, you got to move with the feelings, you got to make time for all of these different avodos, and you don't allow one modality to crowd out another modality. Um, just about learning besimcha, let me just mention one other thing. Again, it's not directly relevant to your question, but I think it's a nice, a nice thought. You know, the great Rav Chaim Moser Grodzinski, who was really the Gadol Hador, uh, with the Chafetz Chaim and after the Chafetz Chaim. He died in 1941. The Chafetz Chaim died in 1933. So uh, Rav Chaim Ozer was an Eloy and a uh, tremendous, tremendous guy and posek. Uh, but a lot of his time, a tremendous amount of his time, uh, he was involved in all sorts of stuckas, really thousands, ten, maybe tens of thousands of widows and orphans and refugees. I mean, he took care of them all. So uh, sometimes he'd be learning with someone, and it was time to stop learning. So he said, it's time to put away, put away our olam hazeh so we will work on our olam haba. Meaning, he looked at Torah learning not as, well, I don't like to learn that much, but I'm going to get my olam haba. T Torah learning was his olam hazeh. That was the real pleasure. The work with the widows and the orphans, that is what he's going to get his olam haba, haba for. So the notion of having that actual visceral enjoyment in the learning of Torah. Yeah. Um, 
one of the main argument, uh, sorry, this is a sentence. One of the main arguments the yeshiva community says, according to their reasoning, that we don't generally serve in the IDF, is that warfare has become very technological, and we do not need the manpower we once might have. Did recent ev events prove this incorrect? And do we have any arguments left that secular Israelis could understand, even if not accept? Yeah, so the question was, again, there's a lot of background to that question. Um, obviously, um, most of the yeshiva world, not all, there are quite a few that do serve in the army, Hester, but most of the, at least black hat yeshiva world, Haredi world, whatever you want to call it, um, does not uh, serve in the IDF and does not advocate that uh, they serve and indeed is in opposition, certainly to any compulsory draft. Now, the immediate question, let me, let me give a little background to, because in order to answer that question, you need a little background. The immediate question that people raise is, well, wait a second here. If you're telling me there's an exception for, let's say, full-time Torah learners, is that even true? Because we know there are certain exceptions from military service, people in the first year of marriage, etc. But the Mishnah says in Maseches Sota that those exemptions only apply for what are called optional wars, wars of expansion, which we don't have today because you need Urim Vitzumim. But a Melchemes Mitzvah, there is no such thing as an exemption for a Melchemes Mitzvah. Uh, even the Kala is taken from the Chuppah, etc. Now, what is a Melchemes Mitzvah? What is a Mitzvah war? So the Rambam says there are three types of Mitzvah wars. A war against the nation of Amalek, which we really can't identify. A war against the seven nations of Canaan, which are extinct. But the third is a war to defend the Jewish people from an enemy that wants to destroy. Now, based on that definition, uh, an enemy, really every war that the state of Israel fights, and certainly uh, the war we're fighting now, would qualify as milchemet mm -hmm. mitzvah, because you have people that want to kill us. Now, if it's true that once something is a milchemet mitzvah, there is no exemption, because that is the case, so the question becomes, what is the halachic argument that full-time Torah students should be exempt from military service? Uh, exemptions only kick in in Milchemes Rishut. They do not kick in from Milchemes Mitzvah. And the wars that we face qualify as Milchemes Mitzvah. Right? So that, that is, is an issue. So one of the arguments, and so now this is where the question begins. So one of the arguments that has been made is this. It is true that there's no automatic exemption for Milchemes Mitzvah. And it may also be true, it is true, that the wars we fight are Milchemes Mitzvah. However, that does not necessarily mean that military conscription for combat has to be at 100% level, because there is no military need, meaning the notion that there's no exemptions just means anybody that is needed has an obligation to fight. Right? But it doesn't mean everybody is needed. And indeed, even in the secular Israeli society, not everybody uh, is... Order. There are plenty of exemptions outside of yeshiva students and the like. And certainly many people have non-combat positions. So the argument has been made that since warfare today does not depend as much on manpower numbers as it might have in the olden days, we have... Uh, technology, we have aerial bombing, we have the like. So consequently, the argument would be there is not a compelling military manpower shortage, and therefore people who are doing spiritually important things can still be exempt. In other words, you understand the argument here. The argument is, yes, it's a milchemes mitzvah, and yes, milchemes mitzvah don't have exemptions, but that's only when there's a manpower need, and when there's no manpower need, an exemption might still be appropriate. So. The question that was raised is, well, gee, has the most recent event uh, undermined that, uh, that position? And as, as we know, for reasons that are still a little mysterious, this was a massive, massive, massive intelligence failure on the part of the Israeli government. And I'm not boasting when I say that we have probably the best intelligence in the world. I mean, the United States would be jealous of the quality of Israeli intelligence, and yet, apparently, I mean, I obviously I don't know the details, but apparently this caught everybody 
by real, real, real genuine surprise. And as a result, a lot of the warning systems were disabled by drones and the like. A lot of the technology got knocked out ahead of time. And as a result, Netanyahu had to call up, what, over 300,000, amazing, uh, 300,000 reservists. I mean, this is a, 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 you know, a huge, huge, huge number for Israel, uh, for any army, really. Uh, so the argument goes that given the fact, in, in, a, in a way, technology becomes its own weapon. because. <laughs> You have this technology, Iron Dome, but now you have counter technologies that can disable some of the technology. And as a result, strangely enough, if technology cancels out technology, you're back to hand to hand you know, combat, which requires big numbers. So have we kind of undermined the rationale of exemption for Mohammed Mitzvah? Okay, that was the question that was submitted. A very, very excellent question. It is something I think we have to think about. I, I don't think we're quite there yet, Baruch Hashem, and, uh, because I do think that um, it is still a, a fairly safe assumption that most of the time uh, wars, at least or limited wars, can be conducted with a minimum, or at least f much fewer uh, people than was the case. But, but, but you're correct. I mean, maybe there'll be, I will, I will admit, there may be lessons from this uh, conflict that may have some relevance on the issue of the draft exemption. But I want to point out that this argument that you raised, that we don't need manpower and that's why we're exempt, is only one, one argument. There are other arguments for the exemption. Uh, one is a very schwer passage in the Rambam, but it's in the Rambam, where the Rambam mentions that Shevet Levi, the tribe of Levi, were not given land in Eretz Israel because they were a tribe that was set aside for Torah and Avodah Tashem, and therefore Hashem didn't want them to be overly involved in material pursuits. And the Rambam says, this is what the Rambam says, Shevet Levi is also exempt from Milchama, and he says, big Kiddush, even Milchames Mitzvah. Which means, now the question that people debate, what's the Makor of the Rambam? But apparently the Rambam understood that when the Mishnah says in Maseches Sota that a Muhammad's mitzvah has no exemptions, it means only the exemptions of marriage and vineyard and people who are afraid. In other words, the exemptions in Parsha Shoftim that are mentioned in Parsha Shoftim, they don't apply to Muhammad's mitzvah, but the exemption of uh, Shevet Levi does. Now, that's Shevet Levi, that still doesn't get you to where we're going. So they then want to take that Rambam and combine it with another passage in the Rambam, where the Rambam says, and it may, it may, they may not be connected, but he says that any person who devotes his life to serving Hashem through Torah learning has the status of Shevet Levi. So if you put one and one together, you get it too. Uh, but again, that refers to a high madrega. P people have raised the question, can you, legitimate, can you legitimately classify every single yeshiva or kolel person as having the devotion of Shevet Levi? I mean, is the, the Rambam doesn't just say if you're in yeshiva, you're Shevet Levi, but, but okay. But these are part of the question. So what I'm saying is, though, that there is an argument that, um, that there is an exemption for people who devote themselves to Avodah Hashem full time, based on the idea that this is the protection, this is the protection they're bringing to Am Yisrael. And then you get into another question. I'm just throwing out questions, I'm not giving answers tonight. And that is, let's assume there is no exemption. Even if you're learning, you gotta fight a Muhammad's mitzvah. But does that mean you gotta submit to 10 months of basic training ahead of time? Or does that just mean, you know, when the enemy's at the gate, you know, pick up your gun. Now, some will say, well, that's absurd. What are you telling me? You're telling me I have to be willing to fight the enemy when the enemy's at the gates, but I'm not obligated to report for training? Well, some, some have taken that position. They have said, yeah, we will fight when we have to fight. But until we have to fight, why do we uh, put ourselves in that environment? Now, again, I, I understand that that sounds a little ludicrous. I mean, I, I understand that, but that's part of the argument. Now, Chaim Konevsky, people don't realize, Chaim Konevsky, Zichoyen Levracha. I don't think he was officially in the IDF, but he fought in 1948. 
I think for a day. You know, he took a gun, he took a position on a hill or something, you know, to repel an enemy. He says, Mohammed's mitzvah, an enemy is coming. You know, uh, he, did, uh, he did what he did, <laughs> right? But he certainly didn't, you know, put himself in a uh, basic training, you know, for months uh, and months and months. So it is a complicated, painful issue. But I think the bottom line is that uh, even the IDF has not made the claim that there's a significant manpower shortage. Now, maybe things will change. Maybe things will change. We're going to see. In fact, the overall direction in Israel is there's a lot of debate on this from the secular standpoint uh, to go to a volunteer army instead of a draft. You know, the, U the U.S. made that decision uh, many, many years ago. You know, when I was in yeshiva, it was the height of the Vietnam War, and the U.S. still had a draft. I, I, I have my draft card, you know, somewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, people used to burn their draft card and all sorts of symbolic protests. And um, even when the U.S. had a draft, by the way, full-time theological students were exempt, even during World War II, the U.S. always recognized a clerical exemption. Very, very true. But the U.S. moved from the uh, draft to an all-volunteer army. Uh, some people are making the argument from a secular standpoint that they ought to do the same thing in Israel. An all-volunteer army might create greater motivation. So it is interesting that not everybody is arguing like to broaden the draft. There are people who are arguing to uh, eliminate the draft. By the way, I'll tell you a story about um, my great Rebbe, Rav Yaakov Kolevsky, the Colonel of Racha. There's actually an art school biography of him, even. Uh, he was drafted in World War II. What, what, what happened? Uh, an amazing story. Uh, he was learning in Torah Vadas. He was one of the best uh, Talmudim in Torah Vadas. And um, the selective service, the draft, sent people over to test boys and see if they were sincere and the like. Now, technically, the exemption for a person is only if you're studying to be a clergyman, studying to be a rabbi or a minister. So the boys were instructed that when the panel asks you, what, what are you here for? You're supposed to say, I'm studying to be a rabbi. My Rebbe, for some reason, didn't want to say that because he says, I'm not studying to be a rabbi. I'm studying because Torah is what you got to, you know, Torah is lishma. He was told not to say, okay, wait, I'm not, not going to second guess him on this. But he basically, they asked him, what are you, what are you here for? He says, um, I'm studying because I believe studying these books is like the greatest thing I can do with my life. He says, are you planning to be a rabbi? He said, not necessarily. <laughs> So, so he was drafted. He was drafted. Uh, Baruch Hashem, he was not sent overseas. He had domestic duty, and I think uh, he did a lot of kitchen duty. And I, I think his parents went to federal court somehow because they, they said, it's clear that he's studying to be a rabbi no matter what he said. And I think after 10 months, they got him out of the army. But, but he, for 10 months, he was in the army. And he managed to get a deal that every Shabbos, they let him go to yeshiva on Shabbos on the condition that he wear his military uniform. So he came to Torah Vadas every Shabbos, but he had to wear his military uniform. So the story goes that on Sunday, before he would come, go back to the base, he would often go shopping for Svarim in Brooklyn. So uh, he walks into a bookstore in Brooklyn, and uh, he's looking at, you know, Lumbush Svarim. He's looking at a Ketsos, at uh, Onad Yamdiv. So the, the store owner sees this soldier in uniform and he figures he probably needs a sitter or something, or uh, you know, an Engli English English So he says, "You don't really want uh, these swarm. Let me tell you, show you. Let me show you some of the English stuff." He says, "No, no, no. This is what I want." Then he realizes that he this is talking about a lambda and a ben Torah, a person who knows how to learn. So uh, that person wound up being his future father-in-law. He made a shidduch with his with his daughter, and <laughs> that's how he met his wife because he was so impressed with uh, the father-in-law was so impressed with a U.S. Army soldier who was still like le holding in deep learning uh, on his uh, limited time off. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to tell the room we got to pick up our learning a little bit. The alert just buzzed for a hostile aircraft invasion in the entire north. It's all mm. lit up right now. OK. First time the uh, war. This um, is from Hezbollah, they say, or just? Uh, I don't know. No. It's not. It's, it's live, like, happening right now all, right. all over all the right. north. So, so I, be, I've got this app on my phone for. Uh, Thank you. The hostile aircraft invasion okay, the entire be, Galilee. Be be um, yeah. yeah. My question is uh, is about the war. The uh, the Gemara says that when the least in pray to Hashem for success, 
they pray good, he grants them success. He helps them to steal. And I think the Sephardi Nusaf is different than the Ashkenazi Nusaf, but we learned Hashem, Shomir Pilat Kopeh. Yeah, the Sephardi, yeah. And uh, moreover, I remember when I was in Yeshiva, you told us that uh, the Arabim are such a difficult <coughs> opponent because they do have certain schusim, and they have a certain kesher with Hashem. They have Mila, they have some version of Kashrut, they had Sniot, maybe some people could say they're better with Sniot than we are. And uh, and so my question is is something that I've been struggling with, standing before in Hashem and Tefillah, feeling some sense of confusion and discouragement about that. And even though it hasn't been for me, I can imagine someone might feel something as negative as even betrayal, that to think that uh, the Aravim are, you know, they're praying to Hashem for success to hurt us. And we know that, I mean, we know that they did that. And we know that they had the success and that Hashem answered their prayers. So how do we deal with that confusion in tefillah if we think about that? And moreover, um, do we even have the right to stand before Hashem and say to Hashem, please Hashem, listen to our prayers, ignore them. We know that they're saying, Hashem, listen to our prayers, ignore them. Yeah. And yeah. then even more than that, is there any, uh, is it hashkafically correct to even think of this as like a uh, or schusim arms race or like a tefillah, like Hashem's counting a heshbon of tefillah and schusim between us and between them? Yep, it's a very, very difficult issue. And this is a concept that I admit has given me uh, much, much uh, confusion and uncertainty over the years. And that is the notion that prayer has a power. Prayer has an efficacy, even when it is uttered by a Russia and even when it's for immoral purposes. This is the kayak of prayer if it is belayv shalem, if it is truly sincere. One way of analogizing, it's not really explaining it, is just like there's matter and antimatter, or what's called dark matter, right? Physicists say that uh, I think 90% of the universe is dark matter, meaning it's matter that we can't even detect. We know that it's there. There is something called dark spiritual energy. Tefillah is a spiritual energy, and even when it comes out of darkness, it has a certain power. Again, just to restate what you just mentioned that I had said, Rav Chaim Vital writes, based on Pirkei de Rebbe Eliezer, that the last and most difficult galus that Am Yisrael will face will be the confrontation with Yishmael. And this was said in the 1500s, and the period of Rabbi Eliezer is even earlier. And he says, Yishmael is the most difficult because they are the only one of our enemies that comes with a spiritual power. Meaning, Esav, that represents physicality and brute force. So of course, in the long run at least, Ruchnius, spirituality, defeats physicality. It may be a long process and a very difficult process. I mean, we had a holocaust, but ultimately, Ruchnius will triumph. The danger of Yishmael is a much more subtle danger because Yishmael comes not only with physical brutality, but Yishmael comes with spiritual merits. They are a child of Avraham. They have a koach of prayer. They have a merit of Brit Milah, again, which goes back to Avraham. There is a Tznius. In fact, one of the things that would be very, very funny if it wouldn't be said, I think Jordan wanted to uh, not allow Israeli teenagers to uh, go to Jordan because they said that they're lowering the standards of adolescent modesty. They felt that the Israeli kids were a bad influence on the Jordanian teenagers. Again, it would be, it would be funny if it wouldn't be said, but okay. So, that raises the question that you're raising, again, which is very perplexing, and that means because they have these merits, they can pray for bad things. And there's a certain power in their prayer, a certain power. And the reason why the gullus is so difficult is that we have to counter it with a spiritual power that is greater than their spiritual power. We have that koach, we have that ability for sure. But it means you can't just rely on conventional, you know, physical armies or whatever it is. And indeed, this is very, very clearly the case. If you think about this, uh, the enemy of Yishmael that Yishmael represents 
is an enemy that cannot be con defeated by conventional methods. Uh, number one, the very fact that they penetrated uh, uh, Shabbos is an example of this. But number two, if you remember a few years ago, uh, people at Shimonat Sadek write cars just drive into people. Well, how are you going to stop that? Uh, how, you, know, you can have a million police, you know. There's no way to stop it, meaning there is no logical way of stopping people who are willing to die for their cause. What, they're threatened with death? Bring it on, because then to hate. That's what I want. You see, the Nazis, I have to say, <laughs> at a minimum, if you can say something good about the Nazis, you know, is that they were cowards. So when a Nazi thought he would be killed, starts negotiating. You know, Goering and Goebbels, all these guys, you know, they started negotiating when they saw that the end was near. And Hitler was enough of a coward that he took his own life in a quick way rather than facing the consequences. So Nazis were cowards. So cowards can be defeated by overwhelming military force. Or even the Cold War, right? The old nuclear arms race. I don't know if you remember it, but uh, the, the, old, the old Soviet Union. So the whole Cold War that lasted for 40 years was based on an acronym that's called MAD. MAD, crazy. Mutual Assured Destruction. What does that mean? We know that the Soviet Union is not going to bomb the U.S., because if they did, we would bomb them and they would be destroyed. And since they don't want to be destroyed, they're not going to try to destroy us. Mutual assured destruction. Assured that no one's going to act. That's why each side needed enough nuclear weapons to destroy the other side. Now, mutual assured destruction only works when you either have cowards or at least normal people, people who don't want to die. But when you have people who don't care if they die, then how are you going to stop them? There's nothing you can do. So really, the statement of Rav Chaim Batal that Golis Yishmael is impossible to defeat by conventional military means, it, you know, is even true in a simple political way. There's no way. You know, you do your Ishtadlis, but there's no particular way that you can guarantee anything. So the, the dilemma is we need spiritual ways of defeating them. And this does raise a philosophical question. Why should God listen to prayers of people who want to destroy Am Yisrael? Why should those tefillahs be makobal at all? Uh, this is a tefillah to do something evil, a tefillah to do something bad. Why should God listen? I mean, if we were drawing, if we were, you know, drawing our sketch of God, we would build into the program. God listens to prayers for good things. And God does not listen to prayers for bad things. I mean, that, that seems to be fairly commonsensical. And yet we do find that prayer is such a miraculous power in the universe that it can even be employed as a zuchus to perpetuate evil. And I, again, I, I will openly admit that I can identify that as a phenomenon. I, I can't fully uh, say that I understand it. But in a way, it comforts us because this is the koach of tefillah. Ad kach, the koach of tefillah. Even for that which is improper. So as a result, the big challenge of Golas Yishmael is to improve ourselves in tefillah, in the schus of Torah learning, in sneas, and then generally in Bein Adam Lechavero, Abbas Yisrael, all those other things as well. Uh, but it is, it is a real issue. And yeah, yeah, you ask me, does it depend on counting up sechuyos? Uh, well, it actually does. That, that's the cheshman. Uh, now, one thing we do know, the one thing we know is God will not allow the Jewish people to be destroyed. That much we do know. But a lot can happen until you get to the point of total obliteration. Yeah, the Jewish people will always survive. Okay? But as I say, there's a lot that can happen up to that point. And therefore, we need many, many zechuyos uh, to try to forestall that from happening. Yeah? If someone is doing many mitzvot, bein adam lechavero, but is severely lacking in bein adam makom, how does that affect him? Is, is that make his avoda incomplete? Or, you know, some people, they don't learn, but they give a lot of tzedakah, or they do a lot of community work. So, like, how does that person, I guess, fit into the equation? And should they, you know, seek more spirituality? 
Well, like anything else, you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us uh, 613 mitzvahs, most of which we're not even able to do, but in the mitzvahs that we're able to do, there's Bein Adam Lamaka, Bein Adam Lechaveiro. We are imperfect and we are defective if there are mitzvahs we're not doing. So uh, the Bein Adam Lechaveiro person who doesn't keep Shabbos and Kashrus is spiritually defective, but I want to emphasize absolutely the same thing is true the other way. The Bein Adam Lamakam that doesn't have Avas Yisrael, that doesn't care about others, is spiritually defective as well. So it's not a question of which is more important. It's a question that we need both. Like, which is more important, your heart or your brain? You know, you know you're going to die if you're missing any one of them. So both of them are essential for life. So you can't really argue which is more important. Now, I will tell you, though, I will tell you uh, an interesting, I'll tell you two, Vertlach. One from the Mabit, who lived in the time of Rav Yosef Karo. He was a Dayan in Svat. And the other is a medrash, Tana Devei Eliyahu. Uh, the Mabit says the following. Uh, it's a well-known idea that in the Aseris HaDibros, the first five Dibros are Bein Adam Lamakam, between man and God. And the second five Dibros are Bein Adam Lechavero, between man and man. This is a well-known distinction, although it is a little bit of a problem, because the fifth commandment is honor your parents. So people do ask the question, why is the fifth commandment on the Bein Adam la Makom column? You know, that is a question. But part of it is that honoring my parents is gratitude because they gave me life, and therefore that brings me to honor God who gave me life. In other words, it's all, it's all connected to gratitude. Okay. But if you go with that generally accepted idea, first column is Bein Adam uh, la, la Makom. Second column, Bein Adam la Chavero. Then you'll notice the following. The first column has a lot more words than the second column. The second column is very staccato. Lo tirzach, lo tinaf, right? Very, very short. And yet we have a Messira that the engraving took up the same amount of space, surface area. First column, second column. So if the first column has more words and the second column has less words, but it takes up the same surface area, that means the letters of the second column must have been larger than the letters of the first column. You see, the font, I don't know if you, don't know if you use font for engraving, but the engraving font must have been larger. Now, that means when Moshe Rabbeinu comes down on Yom Kippur with the second luchos, the first luchos we never saw, they were smashed. But when Moshe Rabbeinu comes down with the second luchos, and I see him in the distance, and I put on my glasses to see what is on those stones, which mitzvot will I see first? I'm going to see the Bein Adam L'chaveiro mitzvot before I see the Bein Adam L'makam mitzvot, because the Bein Adam L'chaveiro is a bigger engraving size. So the Mabit says we have a beautiful remez from here, how important the mitzvot Bein Adam L'chaveiro are. And sometimes in the religious world, we, we ignore them a little bit. So yeah, the person who only does Bein Adam L'chaveiro is missing a lot. But it's also true the other way. We've got to remember that. Now, the Tanit Ve'elio Medrash, I want to tell you, is a remarkable, remarkable Medrash. That I'm almost a little worried to say it because people can use it uh, in improper ways. You know, Tanit Ve'elio is actually a medrash based on the teachings of Elio Hanavi, who comes back to earth and discusses things with people. So uh, in, in Tanit Ve'elio, and I, I have the par I don't remember the parak, but I, ha I have it written down. Elio Hanavi says to someone, there are two things that Hashem loves totally. One is the Torah, and one is the Jewish people. And Hashem loves both of them unconditionally. So the person asked Elio Hanavi, which who asked Hashem, which one do you like more? And Hashem initially said, I'm not answering that. I plead the fifth. <laughs> but Elio Hanavi pushed him. Elio Hanavi pushed him. And Hashem said, B'nai Yisrael, the Jewish people, even more than the Torah itself. Quite amazing. And again, I, I, I don't know on what, what, what the implication of that is whatsoever. But that is the idea of the depth of Hashem's love for the Jewish people, that it was even greater than the love for the Torah itself. Yeah. I think the most difficult part about this war is the 
150 that we know about um, people who were kidnapped. Um, so I guess what is the maximum and the bare minimum that a Jewish state, what, what, is, what are they allowed to do? And yeah. what are they obligated to do yeah. for these? Yeah, you're 100 percent correct. I mean, well, obviously the people who died, we 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 mourn with their families uh, for their deaths. But in, you know, in many many ways, to be a hostage under those conditions is a living death, and uh, the fear and the terror and the the trepidation every single second of the day, and night, and what their families are going through is literally uh, indescribable. And um, actually, I know someone. Uh, who said, you know, his niece is a, is a captive. I mean, so it's, it hits very close to home, even on that, on that level. But you know, the issues are halachically extremely com complicated. Let me just explain what the issues are. And these are issues that Israel has faced for many, many years uh, in different contexts. And that is the, the supposed rationale for the kidnappings uh, is prisoner exchanges. Right? We will release people. Sometimes they live, live up to their promises, often they don't. But, but even in a best case scenario, you release our guys, we'll give you back your guys. Right? Prisoner exchange. So the big question is, does halacha even allow that to happen? Now let me give you a mission in Masechus Gittin. This is a big topic that really deserves a whole shear on its own, but I'll, I'll give you the basic source material. The Mishnah talks about Pidyon Shavuyin. Pidyon Shavuyin are people that were kidnapped and held for ransom throughout Jewish history. People were kidnapped for ransom. So it mentions that a community is not allowed to pay what is called excessive ransoms uh, in order to redeem a captive. And the reason the Gemara gives, the Gemara gives two reasons, but the reason that we pass in the Halacha is that by paying excessive ransom, you are encouraging hostage taking in the future, which will endanger lives in the future. And therefore, the bottom line is, you don't pay an excessive ransom. Now, what does excessive ransom mean in the case of prisoner swaps? So it could be a one for one, might not be excessive, but certainly Israel often does much more than one for one. They might release, uh, in fact, sometimes they've released a thousand to one. Gilad Shalit was, was a big, big thing. Now. Here is the big machlokas. Rav Ovadia Yosef took the position, this is years ago, that the whole sugya in Maseches Gittin is talking about a non-pikuach nefesh situation, meaning they kidnap a guy, they're holding him for ransom. If you don't pay the ransom, they're not going to kill him, they're just going to hold him prisoner. So Rav Ovadia Yosef says, in such a situation, we're not allowed to give in because we're encouraging hostage taking. But Rav Ovadia said, if the person's life is in danger, which is always going to be the case here, they're going to kill the person, then Ravavadja said, we have to look at definite pikuach nefesh now, which trumps speculative pikuach nefesh later, Me meaning like this. Right now, we have a person, or 150 people, whose life is very definitively in danger. They will be killed if we do not give in to these demands. Now, if we give in to the demands and a certain amount of terrorists are going to be released, that is creating a potential danger, which may or may not materialize because we can have security and the like. So Ravadja took the position that definitive present danger overrides concern for future speculative danger. Therefore, it was Rav Ovadia's position that prisoner exchange programs are legitimate as a way of saving lives of Jews whose life is in danger. Many other postgames say that that is a very unlikely and illogical reading of the Gemara because, hey, what are you talking about? Was there ever a time that a kidnapped victim's life was not in danger? It certainly was. And still, the Talmud said, you let a person die in order to avoid these things from happening in the future. Now, let me point out as well another difference. The Gemara was talking about paying ransom money. And the problem was you're encouraging hostage taking. 
When you're dealing with prisoner swaps, not only are you encouraging future hostage takings, but you're actually reintroducing terrorists. See, it's two different things. It's, one is you're encouraging future kidnappings, but the other, there's another element here. You're introducing terrorists back into the population. So many would be against it. Now, we don't like to talk about it uh, so much because, you know, I mean, no, I mean, we don't want Gilad Shalit to feel bad. I mean, we're very, very grateful that he's healthy and he got married and, and everything else. But from a pure halachic standpoint, it's very, very, very problematical because the truth is you're saving somebody, but you're exposing many, many people to danger. In fact, um, I remember that uh, one of the terrorists who was released with Gilad Shalit, um, so the mother of someone who was murdered by that terrorist said, how do you think I feel? that the one who murdered my son is simply being released from prison and allowed to mingle in the population. So it's an amazing thing. You know, officially, the state of Israel has a policy. Just, just like the United States has a policy. We don't negotiate with terrorists. But, you know, th that's a policy that is violated all the time. I mean, uh, it's, it's, a non, it's non-existent as a real policy. We negotiate with terrorists all the time in order to save lives. And not only, I mean, remember this, not only do we release terrorists to get back people who are alive, we have released terrorists to get back people who are dead, to get back a dead body. Halakhically, that for sure is a, even more of a problem. Right? What's, what's your answer to uh, endanger people to get back dead people? So all I can say is that prisoner release programs are very halakhically problematical. Uh, Rav Avadja did approve them for pikuach nefesh. Other poskim would not approve it. Again, the government is not asking Shilas and, and, and the like. Now, the other alternative to prisoner release are uh, things like the Entebbe, Entebbe approach. Uh, Entebbe uh, was, you know, Baruch Hashem, as raids go, was a very, very successful, amazing endeavor. But as, as you know, the head of the raid was Netanyahu's uh, brother. Uh, Yoni, Yonatan Yetanyahu, who, who actually died, died in, in the raid. So even a phenomenally, really miraculously successful, uh, you know, campaign still resulted in, in some very, very difficult casualties. And, and God forbid, it certainly could have gone the other way as well, in which everybody would have gotten killed. But halacha does permit dangerous military campaigns. So it is very, very difficult. I mean, if you think about this, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, it looks like Israel is planning a, a ground campaign. You know, they're going to just enter Gaza and, you know, house to house to house to house to house to house. Extremely dangerous, extremely dangerous. But then, of course, what the Rishayim do is they're going to use the hostages not just for hostage release, uh, prisoner release. They're going to use the hostages as human shields. That's what they do. I mean, you know, if they don't have Jews, they'll use their own kids as human shields. Okay, they'll even do that. But, but when, when they have Jews, for sure, they'll use the Jews as human shields. So what on earth? I don't even like to think about this. What on earth? I'm a 19-year-old I'm a soldier. I come into a building with a machine gun. I got this terrorist who's holding a Jew. You know, what am I supposed to do? I can't kill the Jew. I mean, halakhali, I can't kill the Jew. And emotionally, I can't kill the Jew. So... There's, there's just a lot of problems here. Uh, we don't really know. I mean, again, Entebbe was scripted so that somehow they managed. But as they say, it was, it was a miracle. I, I don't know if you could rely on another Entebbe to be carried out that way. So there's a lot of problems here. Uh, yeah? And my question is on the Pasuk of Bereshit. It says, which to me implies that Shem saw the fruits of the light and then post-creation, he realized it was good, which uh, seems very strange to me. And then uh, continuing in the passage, it says, after that, the Yavdal Elohim Bein Ha'or of Bein So then afterwards, he's already perceived the light is good, but now he's going to make a difference between light and darkness, which implies what he perceived was good before was some kind of odd combo of light and darkness, not light itself. So, um, 
No, yeah, no, um, no. those are uh, those are very very excellent uh, excellent questions indeed. Uh, <laughs> I often say that myself. I don't start the Torah until Parsha Slech Lecha because Bracious <laughs> Bracious and Noah are so deep. I can't even you know I, I can't even connect to it. So I start with Avraham Avinu, which is a little more accessible. I mean, everything in the Torah is infinite, but it's a little more accessible to us as Jews. It's our history, and and and, and the like. So your first question is, and God saw that the light was good, implying that somehow he created something. He wasn't sure if it would be good or bad. And then, ah, pretty good, pretty good, right? So what's the shot? I mean, certainly God knew what it was, and, and God wouldn't have created it had it not been good. So what does it mean that God saw that it was good? So, so here I would think the following. I would think that maybe the meaning of saw, vayar in Hebrew, is a little different than the connotation of saw in English. Like when we say in English, I saw that it was good, that implies that until then I didn't know. And that's your question. But I think um, that in Hebrew it would have a kind of a different connotation. God always knew that it was good, but there was nothing for him to see until it was created. So what he's saying is, I now see its goodness. I knew its goodness. I see its goodness, you see? So it doesn't mean he wasn't aware until that point. Now, in terms of the idea that he saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness, what does it even mean, he separated the light from the darkness? Does that imply that the light was mixed with the darkness? Whatever that would mean. Does that make it a less bright light? And God pulls out the darkness from the light. What does it mean separating? So I think the idea would be this. The idea would be that separating means even before the sun and the moon, he assigned a definitive sphere, meaning God created light and God created darkness. Darkness, by the way, is described as a creation also, not just the negation of light. And then God gave it a sphere, meaning there's a sphere of time called Yom, which I put the light in, and a sphere of time called Laila that I put the Choshech in. So Vayavdel is the assigning of times of the day, times of the 24-hour period. And even though that full demarcation could not occur until the fourth day when you had a sun and a moon, but the truth is, even with the first three days, there still was a day and a night that was simply God's creation. 12 hours of light, followed by 12 hours of dark. Uh, yeah? Exactly on that. Um, yeah. He said he had to separate the light and the dark. Presumably yeah. he could have done that spatially. He could have made a land of light and a land of dark. <laughs> but instead he felt the need to make time be the primary means of separation of light and dark. Yes. Well, well, a few things. First of all, uh, there is, because of time zones, there is, there is indeed a spatial That's division as well, because you do have part of the world will be dark, part of the world will have light, you know, so you actually do have that as well. But I think the reason why he didn't create a permanent spatial division is because light, which really represents the divine presence, is needed everywhere. Every part of creation needs to be suffused with light. You can't have a world, a part of the world, which is perpetually dark, because that would be kind of a removal from God's presence. And uh, that's an important musr, that in all darkness there must be some element of light. Does it work backwards as well, that you need that darkness as well? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, there's a verse in Kohelis that says, Yisrael ha'or min the superiority of light over darkness. But if you read the word min, the superiority of light is from the existence of darkness. It is darkness that enables us to appreciate light. Uh, and that's true in life generally. It is the sadness and the adversities of life that gives us the simcha in the joyous, in the joyous moments. There can be no ups unless there are downs. And therefore, indeed, it is the dark moments that, that bring out the light in the moments of joy. So that, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so many of us right now are considering should we stay in Eretz Yisrael, should we go back to Kutzlaretz? Yeah. And I've heard from many rabbin 
that our Torah learning, our Limit Torah, is helping Am Yisrael, that we're on the front lines of the spiritual battle. And I'm wondering what, how the impact is different learning in Eretz Yisrael versus learning in Kutbar, is there a difference in the power and the impact we can make? Yeah, you know, so, so you are 100% correct that uh, learning brings bracha and brings Yeshua and brings rachamim into the world wherever you're learning. So even if you go back to New York or Baltimore or California or Chicago, your learning helps, and that's why we are very grateful uh, to the Yidden in Chutzlaritz who are also davening and, and learning and giving staka uh, for us. But, number one, there is a special zechus of Eretz Yisrael. But number two, number two, besides the fact that it's Eretz Yisrael, there's a special zechus of people who want to share in the most direct way the suffering of Am Yisrael at a time of distress. That you're basically saying, these are my people. They are suffering. They are going through hard times, at least on some level. I mean, Baruch Hashem, we're not going through the same hard times, but on some level, I want to share those hard times. That itself is a great zechus. So it's not just the learning, it is the idea that you're no se ba'ol. You are carrying, sharing the burden that others are sharing. And I will tell you, people tell me, I, I, don't, I wasn't here uh, then, that uh, the last Gulf War was the same issue. Leave, not leave, stay, you know, all the issues people were. And then maybe, maybe it was a little worse because a lot of the, uh, the bombs came closer uh, to this part of the country. Uh, so Rev Schiller has often tells me that uh, he could not tell people they had to stay. You know, you can't really tell somebody you must stay. You know, this is a very individual decision that you make with your family. So some people left and some people stayed, but he said the people that stayed felt that they gained a certain spiritual aliyah that they wouldn't have gained had they simply left. Uh, kind of, um, you know, sharing a war together can, can bring people together in a very, very uh, special way. Uh, so again, I, 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 I cannot take the achrayas to tell a person uh, what they must do. I know it's a very individual decision, but I think it's a good thing to try to stick it out and, and share the burden with the Jewish people in their land. Yeah. Here's the Sunday. I heard that we celebrate Rosh Hashanah as the creation of Adam. How, do, how can we explain archaeological structures and art that dates back thousands of years? Do we believe in humans existing before Adam or Rishon? Yeah. Uh, this is, a, again, a very, very complicated question. And um, I, I don't necessarily say that we have a definitive answer. Uh, the issue of uh, Adam is only 5,784 years old. And yet we seem to have archaeological dating. Uh, in which you have homo sapiens, human beings, even art of human beings, intelligent uh, creations that seem to be older than that, coming from human beings. Now, you know, there are different approaches there. Some say, well, who says carbon? You know, some people discount carbon dating and, and the like. But there is an approach, and you need to develop this. I, I, we don't have time uh, to fully develop this idea, that Adam was not the first homo sapien. There were human creatures before Adam, but Adam, Adam was the first who had the divine spark of God. Meaning, even in terms of evolution, you know, there could be man coming from monkeys and apes, and whatever it would be, and maybe intelligence was very highly evolved. But intelligence is not the same as a divine soul. A divine soul is a singularity. And what happened according to this understanding, and again, there's a lot of details you have to work out, but what happened was that God chose some homo sapien from the group and endowed him with a unique divine soul. And he realized at that point that he was different. That's why he couldn't find a mate, right? He couldn't find a mate. It wasn't just, you know, the dog or the cow was not suitable for him. The human beings were not suitable for him because he was no longer of them. He was no longer part of them. They were highly developed apes with tool-making skill and uh, opposable thumbs. But that's about it. The godliness of the soul was not there. 
and Adam realized that. Again, there's a lot that you have to work out in the Pesukim, but there, there is such a Mahalich that's mentioned. Um, Rav Gedalia Nadal, uh, <coughs> very interesting person, a person who was a Talmud of the Chazanish, a Chavrusa, Rav Chaim Kanyevsky, a person who was certainly capable of being a Rosh Hashiva of any, any yeshiva in the world, but he wanted to be Nanem Yegiya Kapov. He was a builder, a Kablat, a farmer. He, uh, when he died, Rav Chaim Kanyevsky said, uh, he was unique in the generation, which has a double entendre, actually. I mean, he was saying he was unique, but also his path was not for other people to follow, you know, whatever, it was kind of that. Very, very unique. So Rav Gedalia Nadal uh, gave a series of private shiurim, private, private shiurim, on creation of the world, age of the earth, how do you reconcile science and creation. And one of the Talmidim wrote a summary of those shiurim. And it's available, it was available online, I'm not sure, it's called Mitoraso Shel Rav Gedalia, in which these ideas come out. And they're very controversial. And as usual, uh, many people say, oh, this Talmud is misrepresenting, or Gedalia never said, you know, who, who knows? Uh, but nevertheless, this is an idea that's presented based on Rishainim, based on Rishainim, that there were humans before Adam, but Adam had the singularity of the divine soul. The question becomes, what happened to those humans? That means Adam is living in a world that a lot, a lot of human beings. Were they in the Gan, Gan, Gan Eden? Or no, they were in the rest of the, they were always in the rest of the earth and the light. But Papashtus, you know, they got destroyed by the Mabel, so, you know, so they're not around anymore. Uh, but there was uh, such, uh, such an idea. So it's uh, something to think about, but there's a lot that we don't know. You know, I'm going to check. Rafai Gain, who was the last of the Gainim, and many say the greatest of the Gainim. And by the way, I mentioned that some say the Vilna Gaon was a Gilgal of Moshe Rabbeinu, but they also say he was a Gilgal of Rafai Gain, which means Rafai Gain was a Gilgal of Moshe Rabbeinu. Rafai Gain was very, 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 very great, but I don't recall that yet. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll check it. Now, in terms of Gaigan Magog starting on Sukkot, uh, that already uh, you have Makairis and Chazal. Chazam uh, Sarver did talk about that, but, but again, Chazal talked about that, and uh, the Navi Zechariah, which was the Haftarah for the first day of Sukkot, at least suggests the idea of Sukkot being connected to Gogo Magog. There is no question, I talked about this, Sukkot is very, even more so than Pesach. You know, we talk about Pesach as the Geula, but the emphasis in terms of Gogo Magog and the pre-Messianic Chavle Moshiach, Sukkot is even more Makushar to that whole Tekufa than even is Pesach. It really is Gaigu Magog, the Pariachag, the diminution of the Pariachag. And I had mentioned 35 cows or bulls are Yishmael and 35 are Esav, and they're being diminished to show that Esav and Yishmael are going to be diminished. The Nisa Chamayim Vahayayin, Rabbeinu Bachaya says, the Nisa Chayayin is connected to Esav, that's a fire, which is the red color of wine. The Nisa Chamayim is connected to Yishmael, that's called Mayim, Eshu Mayim. And the Nisuch means they will come back to Hashem and be given to the Mizbeach. So all of these intimations are there. But, but I'll check if I go and actually gave a date. I would be, I would be surprised, but, but I'll check. It, it may, be, may be possible. Rav Gan was a great Makubu, by the way. Uh, we don't always associate the Ga'inim with Kabbalah. But Rav Gan Badafka was, in fact, a, a great, uh, a pre-Ari, obviously, but, but a, he was a great Makubu of the older Kabbalah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was in Isaiah the other day, and there was a shul near there, and there was a Sidim saying to Hillen. And I'm wondering, are they saying to Hillen because they want the state of Israel to win, or because they're uh, very emotional about Jews being killed? And I just don't yeah. know how, to, how, to, how that Zionism would be balanced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 here, so here's the thing. Uh, the thing is this. The thing is that what I would hope for, what I would hope for is, um, I don't think fundamental attitudes about Zionism are going to change because those are philosophical issues and halachic issues and those are going to remain issues. 
But I think uh, the hope would be there would be greater appreciation, greater concern, greater avas Yisrael. So uh, even if I'm an anti-Zionist, I look at a Zionist, but I, I see them as a member of the Jewish people. I love them, I care about them, I'm worried about them. So what often happens is, now sometimes it's only short term, and that's a real chaval, but at least in the short term, we all become united. We do much better. I mean, it's an unfortunate part of the Jewish experience, and maybe the human experience that we do much better in terms of caring about each other in times of tragedy and sorrow than we do when times are good. When times are good, you know, I live my life, you live your life, and what you do is of no interest to me. When times are difficult, we care about each other in a very, very deep way. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if when Emir Sashem times get good, we would be able to carry over that love? But in terms of fundamental attitudes, I, I, I don't think so, because there are you know, real philosophical issues. It's not just politics or, or, or whatever, whatever it is. So I think when you talk about what are the Haredim praying for, I think they're praying that, our, that Jews should not die, Jews should not be killed, there should be peace and the like. They're not praying for the success of the state of Israel as a governmental entity, but they are praying that Yidin should not suffer and be able to live their lives, return to their families, and serve Hashem. I Just think. a follow-up. Yeah. So the few Hasidim that do believe that it's better to be under the, the Arabs until Mashiach comes, would it be an Isser for them to donate to Hamas? Or, or donate to okay, there, there is, okay, it's very, very Pasha to me. It's very Pasha to me that it would be a tremendous Avera, it would be a Chilol Hashem, it would be a tragedy for them to donate to Hamas. This has nothing to do with Interi Kartel. Let's assume I'm against the state of Israel. Let's assume I believe there ought not to be a Jewish state. Let's assume I believe that Palestinians, you know, should, I mean, crazy, but all right, uh, that Palestinians should rule over all, instead of a two-state solution, one-state solution, Palestinian state. But you don't give support to murderers of your people. What type of thing? What would the Sapper Rebbe say to that? What, right? So that's a different thing. If we ever get to a place where we have Palestinians who are willing, you know, to give, give Jews access to our holy places and daven and learn and do mitzvahs, then we can talk. I think it would still be crazy, but then we can talk about Jewish state versus not Jewish state. But not to murderers, people who cut the heads of your babies off. Now, you happen to be right. Unfortunately, there is a lunatic fridge out there that probably is supporting Hamas. I, I haven't seen it yet. Maybe they'd be embarrassed to show their face, but although they're usually not embarrassed. Uh, but those are, I will be charitable by just calling them insane. I have only two possibilities, either they're evil or they're crazy. So I will judge them and call them crazy. But that has nothing to do with Turkata. Now, I'll tell you a story again. Every time I tell this story, I'm going to get in trouble because uh, they tell me, th my contacts in Satmar, I have extensive contacts in Satmar, tell me it's not true. So I'm going to announce ahead of time that many Satmar tell me it's not true. Okay, so please hear that. I know that. But I'm going to tell the story because I think in Hashkafa it makes a point, even if it's not factually true. Okay, in Hashkafa. So maybe I'm using it as a parable. I'm using it as an allegory to illustrate a certain attitude, even though maybe, maybe it's not true, although I, I, in my heart of hearts, I really hope it is true. That is, in 1968, Hubert Humphrey was running for president against Nixon. Now, Hubert Humphrey was a liberal. He lost. Uh, he was an old Zionist from before 1948. He fought for the state of Israel. Uh, he really was a big, big supporter of the state of Israel. He was a non-Jewish Zionist, a real strong Zionist. So we heard there's a lot of Jews in Williamsburg. So, Satmar uh, Hasidim. So he figured he would go and make a campaign speech with an interpreter, and uh, he'd get their vote. He'd get like, you know, thousands of votes in New York. So he starts there with an interpreter. He starts talking about, I am a Zionist. I support the state of Israel. No matter what, since 1945, after World War II, I supported Israel. And he notices, or his aide notices, that the crowd is not too enthusiastic. They're not like, you know, they're not applauding him. So the guy realizes what's going on. So he actually goes, he had a, a Yiddish-speaking staffer. He actually goes to the Satma Rebbe and apologizes. He says, you know, Senator Humphrey, uh, or actually he was Vice President Humphrey, 
Guy Shekap, he doesn't understand all the ins and outs of the Jewish community. He, he thought all Jews are Zionists, etc. says, please, he has a very good heart. Don't hold it against him. So he noticed that the Rebbe was smiling. The Rebbe was smiling. And the Rebbe said, this is the story. Again, <laughs> please, Satmir, do not write to me. I, maybe I'm saying it as a mashal, okay. Uh, but I believe that mashalim have a place also. That the idea was, listen, I'm against the state of Israel. I believe there ought not to be a state. I believe the state ought to be dissolved until Mashiach comes. Yeah, I believe that. But the Jewish people are my people, and this is a family disagreement. I don't want my people to be hurt. And if you are providing them weapons and military aid so my family doesn't get hurt until they come to their senses and dismantle the state, I am in support of that military assistance. Now, again, true or not true, <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't know. But it makes a certain point. I don't want Yidin to be hurt. What does that have to do with the state of Israel? You can be for Israel, against Israel. You can say it's good or not good. You can say we can have a state when Mashiach comes and not before Mashiach comes. Okay, debate it, argue it. The Gemara in Kesuvas, uh, you know, Kuf Yud Aleph, Big Sugya, we should talk about it sometime. But I want people to be killed. I want people to be murdered. You can't, you can't go there. You really can't go there. And, and you know, the Satmarav would never, ever, ever have approved supporting an organization like Hamas. I just cannot imagine under any circumstances. Yeah? Well, my other question about uh, Lashon Hara. Um, I, as for many of us at the Shiva, at the Shiva um, if, you know, we talk about anonymous relatives, or you know, we have a question that would fall into the general category of, of Tuelas. Um, you know, we have to talk about our situation with our, with our family or whatever, and then you know, um, some productive um, you know, halakhic conversation will come out of that. But oftentimes, we maybe throw around, oh, someone's in my family's not sure, Shabbat, they're married to a non-Jew, they don't speak kosher. We just throw that around maybe a bit lightly. And we assume, oh, they're not religious, you know, we can say it. But it seems like a, a serious iser if there's no toelas. And we, we, throw, we say that often. Is, is, there, is this something to worry worried about? Um, yeah, over yeah. So this is, a, yeah. This, no, this is a very interesting issue. You know, I, I will tell you a, a little known fact. And maybe I shouldn't tell you this. And maybe there's a reason why it's a little known fact. And that is... When the Chavitz Chaim wrote his very, very comprehensive, detailed book, not only on the Musr of Lashon Hara, which is Shmir HaLashon, but on the laws of Lashon Hara, say for Chavitz Chaim, that's why Chavitz Chaim, there were actually Gedolim that were against writing a book on the laws of Lashon Hara because they actually said you can't codify it as definite rules because it all depends on every situation is very unique, and it's not like you know, meat and milk that has you know, very, very definite rules. Now, the Chavitz Chaim acknowledges that with concepts of toelis, which is very open-ended, but still, they actually felt, don't make rules. A person should just absorb the Musser idea that don't say negative things unless you have a good reason. And then you kind of have to talk to your Rav about what's a good reason, what's not a good reason. So there actually was some opposition to what you might call the codification. And in fact, one might even argue, perhaps, that maybe that is why until the Chavitz Chaim, the Rishayim didn't codify Lashon Hara as a halachic, right? The Rambam has Hilchus Lashon Hara in like two paragraphs. The Rambam didn't, now, the, you know, again, I mean, we can debate that. You could say that Hashem left this job for the Chavitz Chaim to do. Or some argue that maybe Hashem, you know, had a different cheshman in mind. Okay. But part of that is exactly the issue you're raising, and that is Lashon Hara is a very, very severe issue. You've got to take it seriously. There's no question. And unfortunately, we live in a world where people don't take it seriously. But Lashon Hara cannot be a chokehold on the need to communicate important issues that help you through life. A child is being bullied in school. He comes home with, you know, a bloody forehead. I can't tell you because it's Lashon Hara, whatever it is. I mean, there sometimes needs to be discussion, right? So the difficult balance is, and that's where Toelis is a very important idea, that we have to encourage communication. We have to have an ability to talk about things. We have to have an ability to work out things, parents and teachers and children and the like. 
So you got to have that balance. So the notion that you know a person who's about tshuva talks about his family and has to talk about uh, their don't keep Shabbos or kashrus. Uh, when you're talking to a Rebbe, and even if you're talking to your friends, to kind of figure out how to negotiate things and share your experiences. That's part of Toelis also. I share my experiences. How do you deal uh, when you come home and, you know, uh, the kitchen is not kosher or whatever it is? So I would 100% certify that as a Toelis, right? So I would adopt a pretty broad definition of Toelis when Balei Tshuva, in particular, are trying to work out issues both among themselves and with their Rebbeim, but even among their friends, you know. Now, but you are right, you are right. At some point, there are going to be limits. Like, you know, you don't have to talk about uh, the affair that your father had, you know, whatever it would be, if that's not part of the immediate discussion. But there's another aspect besides Toelis that one has to go into, and that is, I'll just raise this as a question, and you can check, the Chavitz Chaim talks about it. Is it Lashon Hara to say something bad about a person if the person themselves don't consider it bad? And that's a whole different Nakuda. In other words, if I have a parent who's not Shomer Shabbos, but he doesn't consider that to be wrong, then an argument might be made that it's bichlal not Lashon Hara for me to say, my dad is not a Shomer Shabbos, because it doesn't embarrass him. In other words, some say the definition of Lashon Hara is to say things about a person that they would be ashamed of. Right? So, in effect, there are two different types of heterim that may be relevant to this shaila. One is the inyan of Tayeles, and the other would be the inyan that if mitzad, the person you're talking about, it is not a gnus, it is not considered a negative, then it may not fall into, under the definition of Lashon Hara, right? So that's another thing to consider. But I would generally try to keep myself to, to the Toelis category. And then you're right, a person has to be aware that Toelis is not, um, you know, no limits at all. It may be a generous idea, but you still have to be cognizant of those uh, restrictions. Uh, yeah? Yep, yep. As a matter of fact, um, yes. First of all, the Talmud itself says that David HaMelech soldiers, when they went out to war, from David HaMelech's time, they would give these gittins so if they'd be missing in action, the wives would not be agunot and, and the like. And the Baal HaTurim on the Torah actually shows that this was a custom that was even in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu himself. Right? Because the problem of Aguna is very, very serious, and indeed we've had many, many situations of soldiers who are missing in action, and sometimes many, many years. The wives cannot remarry, they're Agunot. So back in 1948, uh, the first Rafa Rashi of the Medina was a big, big Talmud Chacham, Rav Yitzchak Kurtzak. He is actually the grand, he was the grandfather of the present president of Israel, unfortunately he's not from, but a, but a pretty nice guy, whose name is the same name, Isaac Yitzchak Kurtzag is after his grandfather. Uh, he, in fact, he knew his grandfather, he was close to his grandfather as a child. And Rav Herzog was debating about the idea of introducing in military service this notion of a conditional get, that if I disappear for a month, you're divorced. Some soldiers actually still do it, if they know ahead of time, they don't you know, know ahead of time. But it was decided at the end of the day that they didn't want to make this a policy because they thought it would severely undermine military morale. Because part of what keeps a soldier going is the notion that they know their wife is waiting for them. It was thought, uh, she has a get, even though she probably would wait, but you know. So they, did, they didn't want to institute it as a policy, but I understand that some individual people do do it and it, it would halachically work, as a matter of fact, it would halachically work. Um, the problem is, well, let me just explain something, the problem is you would have to renew it every time there was a leave. So for example, 
Let's assume I give her a get and I say, uh, you're divorced, so I don't see you for 30 days. Okay? So if I'm gone for 30 days, she's divorced. But then I come home. So I remarry her. So then when I leave, I've got to give her another get. You know, you know, in other words, you're going to have to renew the get every time. You can't just use the, old, the one get and do it. And that's a big problem, by the way, if you are a Kohen. <laughs> because if a Kohen divorces his wife, you can't take her back. Right? So that's going to be another problem with that. Um, okay, well, thank you. Be well. Uh, what time is uh, Mar Mariva's regular time? What, what time Here? is Mariva? Yeah. 8.20. 8.20. Up there is uh, 7.30. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah.